candidates. This forum will be recorded for future viewing. My name is Sherry McCoy and I will be moderating and asking the questions. In addition to me, the committee members for the City Council candidates are Guillaume Bailey, Joella Marcotti, Stanley Tom, and Selena Williams. For the Fire Board candidate, it is the same group except for Selena Williams. Susan Keefe is our fifth member. We have three candidates for the City Council participating in this forum and one candidate for the Rodeo Hercules Fire Board. Each candidate will have three minutes to introduce themselves. Then each candidate in rotating order will be asked four general questions that were selected by the committee. Responses will be limited to two minutes each. We will then have questions that have come from the public, again with two minute responses. Stanley Tom is our tom timekeeper. He will let candidates know when their time is up by showing them a sign. Before we get started, do any of the candidates have any questions? No. Seeing none. For introductions, the City Council candidates will be first, followed by the Fire Board candidate. The order for introductory statements is Alex, Irina, Tiffany, and then Charlie. Please remember to stay within the three minute time limit. Alex, please begin when you are ready. Thank you, Sherry, and uh, thank you everyone for logging on today on this nice Saturday. I wish I could have been in person with you all. Um, my name is Alex Walker Griffin. I'm running for Hercules City Council. Um, Hercules is my home. I've lived here since I was six years old. I'm a product of Ohlone Elementary, Hercules Middle and Hercules High School, and I really want to give back to the city that I grew up in. So people always ask, well, how does a 22 year old get into politics? really kind of started when I was around five years old. So my dad was the fire marshal of Oakland and he would take me to city council meetings that he was presenting at in Oakland. And then from there, uh, my interest in politics sort of just naturally just progressed. And I remember being 10 years old when President Obama um, was running for office, for, well, running for president um, way back when. And every time I would come home, my mom would have CNN on and I would just follow that election. And then so I actively got in, engaged in politics up to around the age of 13 when I helped out on Governor Brown's campaign back in 2010. And then from there, just kind of um, organically started getting involved in various things. So I was the student body president at Contra Costa College, as long as being the vice president and the senator. Um, when I was the president, me and my friends were able to get the free bus pass program, free breakfast and school supplies program going to Contra Costa College. Along with that, Governor Brown appointed me to the state's community college board formerly known as the California Community College Board of Governors. Um, in that capacity, I oversaw or well, represented 2.3 million students and oversaw um, 115 community colleges throughout the state. In that time, midway through my term, um, Governor Brown reached out to us and we had to create Calvary College, which is the nation's first 100% online community college. So I'm used to looking at challenges that quite frankly don't have an exact manual to do um, how to work with. I worked with seniors for the city of San Pablo. I interned for Congressman Mark DeSanye. I worked for the Richmond City Council. I've worked with little kids in the city of El Cerrito. And currently I work with autistic children. Um, on the side of that, um, me and my friends have a small business that focuses on social justice where we help businesses and different organizations get up to date with the trends that are going on in California. I currently serve in the California Guard and the Army component attached to a military police unit and I will be commissioning as a second lieutenant in a few months. And I volunteer in different capacities. Um, me and my friend started our waterfront cleanup in Hercules when we were in high school. I believe we were about 17 years old. And I also sit on the Hercules Education Foundation Board of Directors. And in my free time, I like to skateboard. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Next is Irina. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on Saturday. Uh, we truly appreciate your support and interest in all of us. And um, thank you, Alex and Tiffany, for being here as well today. Um, mm -hmm. I'm running for City Council to ensure Hercules remains a very diverse community that is governed by trusted, transparent, and effective leaders. I will focus on the growth and prosperity of our city. And um, my husband, my daughter, and I, we lived here since 2006. And we truly appreciate what we have here. As a female immigrant, I'm honored to serve as the chair of the planning commission, where I've had an opportunity to demonstrate my ability to transform the residents' vision into tangible results. Over the last three years, my fellow commissioners and um, I successfully collaborated with the city staff, council, and developers on approving seven major projects that will generate additional revenue for our city. In my capacity as a public servant and also in my profession as the vice president of commercial banking operations, 
for one of the largest banks um, in the United States. I lead with the mission to meet strategic objectives. I inspire others by helping communities and people to realize their full potential. My greatest assets are integrity, resilience, and a strong work ethics. If elected, I will continue to serve our city. I will diligently work on all vital projects, such as the original um, transit in, um, intermodal station, waterfront, safe way, Hilltown, Sycamore Crossings that will bring additional retail and our first hotel. And I will do that while striking a balance between residential, commercial, retail, and public spaces. An equally important part of my mission is assuring that our city has fiscal soundness and long-term financial sustainability. During these unprecedented times, civil unrest, pandemic, economic uncertainty, Hercules needs a proven leader who can be very effective and can bring also fresh perspective. I humbly ask all of you to vote for me. And again, I thank you all for being here today with us to learn more about our platforms and for us to learn more what the needs of the city of um, Hercules are, in your opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Tiffany? Hi, I'm Tiffany Grimsley. I am a Bay Area native. I'm actually a second generation Bay Area native. Um, my mom was born here in Vallejo and I was born in Berkeley, grew up in El Cerrito. And I, my family and I have lived here in Hercules since 2013. I have been an active community member serving as a volunteer at all five of our public schools here. Uh, I was elected to the school site council at Lupine Hills Elementary School. I'm a founding member of a relatively new community organization called FREED, Panola, Hercules, Rodeo, El Sobrante for, El Sob for Equity and Diversity. And I am a member of HEART, uh, Hercules Against Racial Racism in Policy and Policing. I, as a member of the Hercules community, I value our very community-oriented society. When I and my husband, we're looking for a place to raise our three children. We were looking for some place that was inherently family friendly. We were looking for someone somewhere that was community oriented and we were looking for somewhere that was safe and secure so that our children could walk to school and walk home if needed uh, and have plenty of ac safe activities to participate in. And we found that with a community center, with the library, with our, our plentiful parks. I am running for city council because I want to be a part of the future of Hercules. This is our home and I value where we live. I have been actively involved with the city council on a very um, you know, low level, personal level, just asking questions. I am not a person that has been in front or I have not sat on a board, but I've been active on the ground in the community uh, participating, volunteering, giving my time, and listening to the Hercules community members and the heart. Serving on the city council, that I think would be my primary role is maintaining that voice. My single voice means very little, but the collective voices of all Herculeans um, is powerful and, and valuable. And I think there are many Herculeans who feel that their voices have not been adequately heard or um, uh, valued. And I don't think that is necessarily the fault of the city council. I think it's the way that we participate in the way we interact and the availability of many of our community members. We are a diverse society, um, as Irina pointed to, and that means that we have a lot of single family working families. We have a lot of two parent families that are working families. We have uh, stay-at-home parents, we have seniors, we have children and teens. Um, all of those individuals are important. I'm most concerned about our fiscal stability moving forward. We need a, plan, a fiscal plan moving forward. We need safety and security, and we need our residents to know that this is a, going to continue to be a safe and secure place. And my time apparently is up, and I thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlie?
Hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me properly? Yep. Yes. Great. Yeah, uh, I, I want to thank uh, people for uh, reaching out to me and uh, uh, supporting my uh, running for the uh, district board of directors. Uh, I think I've always been a, a strong advocate for fire departments, uh, especially because uh, the fire departments here and in many other places have uh, are an 85% medical first response rate for their calls. And locally, because uh, our doctor's hospital has closed, so now the, the Rodeo Hercules Fire District is our main link to emergency care for Hercules and Rodeo. So I intend to promote the highest quality of uh, crit this critical public service and uh, try to make it maintain the high standards that it has and even improve upon that and guarantee its long-term ability to provide those services. Uh, Hercules also has a fire and smoke risks from wildfires and potential refinery fires, such as the New Star fire last October. Uh, department is unique and unusual because we have uh, training with Philip 66 fire department. So very few fire departments have that kind of training. And I believe that because of the ability of our fire district to respond to that fire, um, it prevented a much, much larger disaster, as it was a, a lot of particulate matter and also uh, probably residue from the firefighting foams spread out over communities like in Crockett and Vallejo because that's the direction the wind was going. Uh, there was a, a lot of other tanks there. That if those would have gone up, it would have been a, a worst five-star fire in this area and could have even spread further to the Phillips 66 refinery. So our, our fire department is critical for the health of citizens and for the ability to prevent not only uh, expanding refinery fires, but also the wildfire mingle with uh, uh, numerous other uh, constituencies and parklands that if those go up, we have to be able to respond as soon as possible so it doesn't spread to a much, much larger area. Uh, and so I think that um, the role of the Hercules City Council in, in, in terms of the fire district is really important and uh, in productive relationship because the city of Hercules, because of its uh, position uh, demographically in relationship to Rodeo has a critical financial uh, stewardship for the fire district. And uh, as it is, we already pay 70% of the costs of the uh, fire department, which is $7.3 million per year. Um, so I intend to try to solidify the relationship. Charlie, your time's up. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Notice that um, Stanley holds up the sign. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. All right. We will now start our four questions from the com committee. Each of you will be asked the same question. It will rotate as to who is asked first. You will have two minutes for your response. So our first question, uh, Irina will start. And the question is, why are you interested in serving? What do you see as your primary role on the city council? The reason, thank you so much, Sherry, for the question and an opportunity to start. Well, the reason why I'm running for city council because I want to ensure that Hercules remains a diverse community. And we need to do it by having a transparent, trusted, and effective leaders running the city, which is the role of the city council. We also need to focus that city council represents the views of our diverse community and assure that everyone's voice is heard and transform into substantial accomplishments. How we do that, we need to ensure that we actively have community involved. And this is why I'm so thankful for 35 participants taking their time during Saturday afternoon to listen. We need to engage community. We need to know what the community's needs are and priorities, and we want to do it to ensure our city continues to thrive, prosper, and grow. 
my top priorities are fiscal soundness and financial long-term sustainability. It's a progressive city planning. And as I said earlier, government transparency and ethics. If elected, I will promote and practice certainly government transparency and ethics. My um, experience as a public servant and being with the planning commission for over three years now will help me with my goal and priority to achieve progressive city planning, especially during these uncertain times and uncertainty that we are facing globally, nationally and locally as it relates to pandemic and potential recession. And then how we do the fiscal soundness and financial long-term uh, sustainability. We need to understand what our short-term challenges are, but also do it uh, very responsibly and understand all of the long-term consequences that our decisions that we will be making today will impact ourselves in the future, but most importantly, our future generation. Uh, Tiffany, you're next. Why are you interested in serving and what do you see as your primary role on the City Council? Thank you. I'm interested in serving. I have a service background. My career has largely been in education. I worked for the University of California for 15 years. Prior to that, I was a teaching intern at Berkeley High School. Um, anyone who knows anything about working in education know you don't do it for the money. Um, you do it because you care. Uh, I care about my community. And so I feel that this is a critical time in our history. It's a critical time for me to step up and step in at a higher level. Uh, I'm an introvert by nature, and so I'm not traditionally sought out uh, uh, front-facing positions. But at this time in our in our critical history, I think it's important uh, for someone who has that passion for the community, who has the concerns for the people of Hercules uh, to be a part of the city council. We have city council members that are very much uh, actively involved with our community and very much care about our community. But we also have some current members of our council that appear a little tone deaf uh, to some of the needs of some of our community members. Uh, and having been a part of uh, community organizations and recent community events, I feel and see and hear the frustrations of some of the community members that want to see something different in our city council. And my primary role on the city council will be conveying that voice. I think um, just kind of keeping that alive, what we're hearing from our community members, the questions that come to the city council, uh, what we're receiving from the community at large. And also, uh, and I think all three of us will, will touch on this, the, the, the plan for our fiscal future. Um, moving our plan forward so that we eliminate our deficit, um, that we continue to make sure that the projects and the plans that we put forward are going to serve our community at large. Um, and also just building a stronger community here in Hercules uh, so that it's not as segmented and that it really is a more cohesive collaborative environment. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, uh, you're next. Why are you interested in serving and what do you see as your primary role on the fire board? Well, my first primary role is to um, communicate with the city council and, and find out what they want and need and from their uh, perspective in the fiduciary responsibility. Um, I would also like to um, probably have to do a various kind of lobbying to make sure that we, we get various funds that are required to keep up the standards of the fire department, um, mostly to make sure that we have really good emergency medical response that's, that's prompt and um, and that we can maintain that and that we can uh, possibly uh, try to staunch some of the um, uh, rollover at the fire department where uh, fire, uh, fire, uh, fire um, firefighters leave and go to other districts. Uh, I want to make sure that um, various needs of, of our city are met promptly so that perhaps it's possible to 
respond properly to uh, people with various kind of chronic conditions that are most likely to be uh, uh, visited by the fire department in emergency situations. Uh, there's different kind of uh, average calls between Rodeo and Hercules. There's a lot of calls in Rodeo over uh, such issues as um, asthma that tends to be a poverty disease and of people who are senior citizens and they're also commonly visited by the fire department. So I, I think the, the, the medical response service and the uh, uh, position of the city of Hercules and yeah. being able to kind yeah. of help the fire district uh, maintain these high quality standards and uh, and, and also there's going to be discussions coming up about consolidation with the larger um, fire districts in our services. Thank you. Um, and Alex, why are you interested in serving and what do you see as your primary role on the city council? Well, I want to give back to the city that I grew up in and I want to make sure that all um, constituents here feel represented, not just humans, but also the wildlife and the animals here are protected as well. Um, I feel that as a council member, you have a responsibility that is to represent the kids, you know, middle aged folks and the seniors. And in my background, working with seniors, little kids and disabled children, um, I've been able to do that and I want to make sure that I continue to do that, but then also look forward um, to new plans and new developments that we have going on and plan for the future and make sure that you know, someone who, who was like me living in Hercules at six years old can say, wow, you know, I'm actually proud of my city and I don't have to always travel so far to actually do something. And as a council member, my responsibility would be to convey that message and the interests of the, of the city and then also work with our state and federal legislators on what we believe is, is best for Hercules. Um, I understand Hercules has some challenges and then there's some unique problems with being a small city in a, in a really big metropolitan area. But I think that we definitely can work with our, our partners to make sure that Hercules is well represented and well met and that we develop and we plan for every sort of situation, whether it's a natural disaster or getting a new park that works for kids with disabilities. So that's how I feel um, myself would be. Okay, um, okay so there, our next question, Tiffany, you will be first with this one. Uh, what are the top three issues facing the council? Uh, well, definitely financial stability. Uh, our city council, our current city council and our prior city council have done a fantastic job of moving our city forward um, out of financial crisis, uh, which we were in not that long ago. Uh, but we do need a plan forward. We do need to um, eliminate our deficit. We do need to continue to uh, look at ways that we can uh, increase our revenue. I am very concerned about security and safety um, for Hercules and, and that takes on many things from transportation and traffic. We're increasing, um, our, our city is growing. We have new developments, which is going to uh, in, increase our traffic and uh, our need for, and our, we're coming in with different types of transportation. So I'm concerned for safety for pedestrians, safety for our motorists. Um, we're also concerned about uh, safety in terms of law enforcement um, and look, making sure that our law enforcement is well trained, um, responsive to community, um, and in that all of our community members feel safe and secure with the environment that we're in. Um, I'm also very concerned about the issue of community, which I keep bringing up. Uh, truly, I, I think there are some members of our community that don't necessarily feel the love and warmth that I, I feel here. <laughs> and uh, I want to make sure that we expand that so that all Herculeans are, are uh, feel that, that they are definitely a valued part of our community. Okay. Um, Charlie, you're next. What are the top three issues facing the fire board? Yeah, the, 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 top, the top three issues of uh, fire board are um, maintaining their um, ability to staff properly over a long-term period. Uh, that's really critical. Um, in 2012, we were down to a total of 12 people in the fire district. Now there is 21 uh, because initially because of the SAFER grant, which was a FEMA grant, and then prop. Uh, 
that gave us long-term stability. Um, so we need to kind of maintain that uh, those um, funds are provided and that we get also grants for various special needs that the fire department has, like equipment and vehicles, et cetera. Um, my, my other goal is to um, make sure that uh, the um, are, are, are met properly uh, with the different kind of um, support and, and warning that, that might go on. So if, if people, uh, for example, are likely to have particular uh, problems on a recurring basis, that the fire department is, is aware of that. Um, when they receive a call. Um, and and the, the, the final thing would be to um, re review um, the capability of our fire district to respond to wildfires promptly and also to um, deal with events at the refinery, such as uh, having different kind of firefighting foams that are non-toxic. Uh, that have been used in the most recent past. And there's many, many other things that um, I would like to uh, support with our, our fire district, especially supporting the individual fire job properly. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, uh, what are the three top issues facing the city council? The number one thing is financial stability. So Hercules, it's, it's been on a steady incline of, of reaching you know, comfort. Um, and, and being well maintained, but there's still that challenge of uh, making sure that Hercules is financially sound for in case of an emergency or, you know, a recession. Um, so how I would want to tackle that is make sure that if 25% of our revenues comes from sales tax, we advocate for the business and let people know that the businesses are here. So that way we can continue um, increasing our sales tax, well, increasing generating revenue from our sales tax. Um, the second thing I would say is public safety. With the new development that we're having, if, if you run the numbers, it's like around 2,000 new residents are going to be here. So that's going to be a new strain for police and fire departments. Um, if, you, if you've been following what's been going on recently, there's been an increase of fire in the area at least I've noticed that there's been an increase in fires um, so my, I, I believe that one of the biggest problems is what are we going to do in case of that paradise fire or you know um, the Santa Rosa fires when the next fire breaks out or even the next man-made or natural disaster even happens people are going to pile into Willow people are going to pile into San Pablo and I think that we need to have a plan for that in case not actually in case but when it does happen and, and we make sure that people are safe and then lastly, I would say community development. Um, Hercules is a nice city, it, it really is. But the thing is, um, one of the biggest problems is you have to travel to actually like really in, really do something. You know, you can't spend your dollars too much here in Hercules. I mean, yes, we do have some amenities like the pet shop, but if you wanted to buy like a pair of shoes or a pair of pants, you always have to travel outside the city. And I think that that's another thing too, because one, you get this city that's in the prime location of the Bay Area, just right off of 80. Um, right at the very beginning of highway four but if you wanted to spend your dollars here then you'd have to travel to pleasant hill to go to sun valley mall or fairfield or wherever so that that's a problem within itself because we could we're losing out on sales tax and we're losing out on giving people a reason to stay in hercules one of the reasons why so many of my friends have left is because they just say that there's just nothing here to do in hercules so retaining people um is definitely one of the issues here okay um arena what are the top three issues facing the city council? Similar to other people on the panel that are being asked questions, I do agree that financial stability is extremely important. We all know the history of Hercules, and I think Hercules did a really good job navigating through some of the difficulties backdating to Great Recession. Um, now that we are in this situation where we are and we do need to ensure that there is no budget deficit, that we're generating additional revenues for the cities, we need to look into new ways to generate uh, revenues. Um, planning is very important. How do we have a proper balance between commercial, residential, and retail? And as well, public spaces. Some of us choose to live in Hercules, and this is how we attract new residents and retain existing residents because we all love our beautiful rolling hills, wetlands, and open spaces, but we have to think how do we reach and strike this perfect balance. Um, having Doing this, we need to understand that pandemic will change a lot of things, how we do certain things. 
Alex just mentioned retail and while sales tax is very important, but should we focus on something where we buy shoes or should we also take into consideration that our residents probably using e-commerce more than ever? And this is where the experience and understanding of the current situation are very important. And with that, of course, with planning comes public safety. We are continuing to grow. Our res residents uh, and population is grow. We are at 26,000 right now, which ties back to the budget. It's all interconnected because we need to be able to support um, our expenditures by generating additional revenues. There are a lot of different ways it can be done, but as I said earlier, I think we need to focus and when we're making decisions, decisions should be transparent. We need to involve our community and have strong community engagement. And our decisions should be focused not only on near-term goals, but with the foresight into what is going to happen in the decades to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question goes first to Charlie. Uh, what is your highest priority as a fire board member and what actions would you take to help achieve that priority? My highest priority is to make sure that the fire department is uh, served by Hercules so it can maintain high quality standards and improve upon those standards. Um, I think that's really, really critical. Um, so it, it means communicating with the, the fire department, with the individual firefighters, with the union and finding out their needs and, and, and see how we can find a common agreement between the city of Hercules and, and the fire district to be able to uh, maintain the fire department at a high quality uh, over the long term. Uh, so that, that is my goal. And, uh, and I also think that it's important to uh, uh, follow up on the, the consideration for consolidation between the different fire departments in, in Contra Costa County because they have resources such as Etc. and also uh, the capability of uh, communicating in, in real time uh, with all the different fire districts that border the large amounts of open land that we have between um, over a dozen different cities in, in our area in case there's uh, any kind of uh, catastrophic or potentially catastrophic wildfire. So th those are my concerns and I, I hope to be able to promote that in the best possible way. Thank you. Okay, um, Alex, uh, what is your highest priority as a city council member and what actions would you take to help achieve that priority? So my pri highest priority is making sure that all Hercules residents feel as if their council member is their next door neighbor or their friend at the same time. Um, I wanna be a council member that you can say, oh wait, I, if, if I have a question, I can reach out to Alex and I know that he's gonna get out to me. I wanna be transparent, open, and then also have community dialogue. So when I was on the Board of Governors, I represented 2.3 million students in the entire state of California. And I was faced with issues that I've never actually had to think about. I never thought about how certain taxes were gonna face certain students in El Centro down in Imperial County or students up in Lassen. So what would I do? I developed a network of people and I would just reach out if I had a question. So what I wanna do is, is keep that same energy and that momentum going by having community members advise me on what they believe is best for Hercules. You know, obviously still keep my councilman hat on, but then at the same time, make sure that every resident feels as if they can have a conversation, they have a seat at the table, and then also be someone that's just there. So you're not just seeing me during re-election time or during some time when it's a campaign. You can, you'll say that, oh, that's Alex. He was there at my kid's you know, performance at Lupine, or he was there at this community event. He's not just here to seek re-election. And I wanna make sure that we have a sustainable city and then that everything in Hercules that, like I said earlier, is encompassed. So we protect our wetlands, we protect our green spaces. And at the same time, we work with our schools, both the John Sweat Unified and the West County Schools to make sure that our students' needs are met. And then we work with different outside agencies and organizations to make sure that we can fill in some loose holes, maybe for some seniors, or like I said earlier, children with disabilities, or even work to make sure that we have um, certain new monies coming in to help projects out. So that's, that's what I think I would like to do. 
Um, thank you. Irina, what is your highest priority as a city council member? What actions would you take to help achieve that priority? My highest priorities would be to promote and practice ethics and transparency. It's very important. We need to earn trust of our community to be um, trusted with representing the community and voice. I also want to focus on community engagement. Um, being on the planning commission for over three years now and having the experience when we review some very important projects, it's great that people uh, comment on Facebook and next door neighbor and some other social media, but how do we engage our community so that we can represent our diverse view on different aspects more broadly and more proactively. So this is what I want to focus on. I want to be just not serving as a council member that sits and makes decision in a vacuum. I want to be able to communicate with our residents and I want them to be more proactive in sharing their opinions. And then of course, uh, financial stability is extremely important for any city. This is what makes or breaks us. So these are the things that I want to focus on. These are my top priorities and um, looking at new ways to work um, on something we did very well as city council, as the city, we overcome a lot of challenges. We all love being here. We all live in our beautiful town and we are seeing that our name is being recognized by some of the major developers, by um, people in who before, when I would say, where do you live in Hercules? And people would be asking, where is this? And now people say, this is this great safe community. And we heard that it's very family oriented and it's very diverse. Look at our demographics. Um, we have um, truly great mix of unique perspectives. And what I want to focus on as a city council that everyone's voice is heard, that people are speaking out, people participating, and they are very engaged. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany, what is your highest priority as a city council member, and what actions would you take to help achieve that priority? Thank you. Two of my greatest skill sets are in problem solving, well, three, three skill sets, generating ideas and bringing people together. Uh, in my work at the University of California, where I was for 15 years, uh, part of my job was in doing outreach and recruitment as assistant director for MBA admissions um, for the full-time MBA program and targeting uh, underrepresented students through my diversity outreach efforts and international students. And I did this in the wake of Prop 209, which meant that I didn't have a budget for it because it was against California law uh, to target specific communities by race or ethnicity. Uh, so my problem solving skills kicked in and my networking skills kicked in by reaching out to outside organizations, bringing them in to help solve the problem for financing my efforts to hosting events in, uh, in, our, in, in place of UC Berkeley, but then bringing those students into UC Berkeley. And I increased enrollment for diversity students for over 100%. Um, I say all that to say that this is, these are the skill sets that I want to bring to the city council, generating ideas so that we are thinking forward, that we are uh, addressing our financial issues by generating new ideas. Um, it is easy to maintain the status quo. It is challenging to think outside the box, and it is even more challenging to try something that hasn't been tried before. Uh, and so I will be there to encourage fellow council members uh, to trust that we, as, a, as a, a body, can implement new ideas and keep our community safe at the same time by, um, by accepting that we may not be able to do everything by ourselves, and that we might need some additional aids and help that we haven't utilized before. Um, in terms of safety and security, just partnering with our our law enforcement with Chief M. Bowden, with our city manager, and keeping our community safe. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, our next question. Um, Alex, you'll be first for this one. Why are you the best qualified candidate? Oh man, that's <laughs> so why am I the best qualified candidate? Um, because I can give you the perspective of 
of basically every constituency group here in Hercules besides seniors, unfortunately. Um, and then also my experience outside of politics has really helped me out a lot. Um, like I mentioned, I've worked with five-year-olds. I've worked, I work currently with disabled kids. And one of the kids that I work with, um, on top of being autistic, he's deaf and mute. So if developing an overall sense of patience and tolerance and understanding, um, I think is really gonna help me out. And then also my ability to help partner and work with people. So when we were developing Calbright College, there wasn't a manual on how to start the, first, the nation's first 100% online community college. Every single day was a new challenge. But what that meant was we had to collaborate and we had to work together and we had to think outside the box. And that's what I wanna do in Hercules. And then at the same time, I wanna bring in community because I haven't left this I haven't left this city for a reason it's because I see it all the time you know you look at the demographics a middle class majority minority city that represents the American dream that so many people are striving for and I want to make sure that every Hercules residence still feels that that American dream is possible and I want to keep pushing the envelope and make sure that in the future people can have a lot of pride in the city and maintain that pride too because I still get all the time well where's Hercules you ever been to Richmond yes you ever been to Vallejo yes you ever drove from one to the other Yes, you've been right through Hercules. And people say, oh, okay, I know that city. And so, I want, like I said, I want to bring that community. I want to bring that sense of every single group has a voice, whether you're Republican, Democrat, old or young. I want to bring that excitement and that youthful energy to the city council. Because I, I can give you the perspective of a 15-year-old. You know, when I was 15, I feel like Hercules didn't have much. You know, but now that I'm a lot older, I can tell you Hercules is a really nice city. It's a great city to live in, but we certainly can improve on, on a lot of things. And that's public safety, that's financial stability, and that's making sure that we work with our school board and our fire board to make sure that Hercules residents are safe and that our kids have the best future ever. Because right now, kids are in a really challenging time. And it sounds kind of weird to hear from someone who's run for city council to say, why should we collaborate with the school boards? It's because I want kids to have a future. And I want to make sure that our seniors have their needs met here in Hercules. And working with seniors, working with young folks, working with autistic kids, and working as an anti-gun violence lobbyist, you know, I've been able to collaborate with people and work with people on all backgrounds. And I want to continue to do that in the city council. Okay, thank you. Irina, why are you the best qualified candidate? Thank you for your question, Sherry. I believe that, of course, we all know that currently we do have two incumbents that are looking for um, re-election and we also have um, at least three candidates and I believe somebody else just expressed their interest. So, but I do know that we have at least three candidates for city council member seat. What differentiates me from um, someone who does not have public service experience yet is that I've been with the city and I started my public service about almost four years ago. I understand the needs of the city. I understand also a lot of inner workings. I know how to collaborate with city council and with city staff, and also how to listen to different opinions that our residents represent. And I worked personally on a lot of vital projects that helping Hercules to uh, achieve our dream of being financially stable and also to continue to thrive. Um, I also familiar with challenges and I will be able to address them. So that's what gives me an edge, in my opinion. Also, my professional experience and personal life experience. We immigrated to this country, my family and I, um, almost 20 years ago. I didn't speak English, but I always believe in um, things that of success. You work hard, you stay humble, and you be honest. And that served me very well in my personal life, in my public service, and in my professional experience. 10 years ago, I did not have any banking experience in the United States. And if you come from Soviet Union, you didn't know the difference between checking and savings account. Today, I manage a group responsible for a huge portfolio that um, we work with different clients and on different products. And I'm proud to lead my team. And the reason why I was successful in that, because I worked very hard, I learned and I continue to learn. And I believe in continuous improvement, whether it's the city, community, or an individual. And my background and emotional intelligence, I believe also will serve me well. I do understand that we all have okay. unique perspectives. Sorry, yes. your, time, your time. No problem, thank you. Uh, Tiffany, why are you the best qualified candidate? Sherry, I think we have three great candidates right here <laughs> participating here today. What I bring to the table 
are my leadership skills, which I've demonstrated through being a director of admissions at UC Berkeley and through my current work leading Freed, Penel Hercules, Rodeo, El Sobrante uh, for equity and diversity, uh, that I'm not afraid to question the status quo. I'm not afraid of new ideas. Uh, and I bring confidence with, without attitude. These are pillars that I learned when I was working at Berkeley and I learned to embody them and I appreciate them and what they stand for. I want to make this great city better. I want to have a stronger um, financial future. I want to have, as we are bringing in new citizens, new residents in the city of Hercules, I want to embrace them and make them a part of uh, Hercules without making our existing residents feel as if they're being alienated or, um, or, or you know, uh, dismissed in any way. I want to continue to build community, bringing in all voices, and I think I know how to do that. Uh, and I want to work with my fellow city council members, with the city manager, and with the residents of Hercules to improve our quality of life. Uh, Alex spoke to our environment. It's important, our safety and security, our financial future, and, our, and the strength of our community, which is I, in the people of Hercules. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Charlie, why are you the best qualified candidate? Well, to my knowledge, I'm the only candidate right now. And so I, I hope I am a qualified candidate. And I'd like to use uh, Tiffany's expression there about what I might bring to the table. So a little bit of my background is that I was a child care worker in a mental health facility for children and youth in Michigan from 1980. And then in 1981, when I moved to San Francisco, I was a child care worker at a a school for uh, um, uh, handicapped, emotionally disabled uh, children. And, uh, and then I, I moved on from there to be a social worker for two years in the San Francisco Tenderloin, working with the North of Market Senior Services Center. Um, I, had a, I ran a drop-in center there that was uh, open uh, for various kind of services related to uh, uh, substance abuse, uh, health care, social work, and uh, social activities. Um, I have a considerable amount of graduate level uh, academic background in molecular biology from University of California, Berkeley, and so and also happen to be a retired chiropractor, semi-retired chiropractor, and so I'm interested and knowledgeable in chronic health issues affecting populations that would most be such as youth asthma patients, and senior citizens. And I'd like to note that Rodeo is 98th percentile in California for asthma, and Hercules has many multi-generation households with elderly persons living there. And lastly, uh, I've written a number of comments uh, for environmental impact reports for uh, the F Phillips 66 and other refineries. And my focus in all those cases are whether uh, Ne might negatively impact public health. So, um, and I've used my background in chemistry and physics. I have a patent in medical imaging to best understand uh, what goes on at a refinery. So um, I can understand the overall processes and uh, maybe any threats such as uh, what happened at uh, New Star and prevent uh, events like that happening in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, our next question is uh, for the city council members. So we will start with Irina. Um, is the city of Hercules doing all it can to protect its residents and others who are present in the city from the effects of COVID-19? And if not, what additional actions should the city take? I think CT, thank you for the question, Sherry, or I don't know if it's coming from the public already, but I think CT did good job so far. And we all facing, it's very unprecedented. I think we followed all of the local and also CDC requirements as it relates to COVID-19. I was very impressed that city didn't skip a bit in terms of planning commission, finance commission, or city council meetings. We were able to transition to remote virtual communication, the same as we have right now. Um, we are all learning this. It's unprecedented times, unprecedented situation. 
I think there will be some impact. Some of the projects maybe cannot be moving forward as fast as we knew that they could or anticipated, which will have potential impact on our budget. And we already seeing signs of it. And I'm not only talking locally, I'm talking globally. However, the city of Hercules did a good job keep going with the projects where we could while staying within the guidelines of um, pandemic regulations and requirements. Um, I think we did a really good job in um, term making sure that communities stay safe. We closed some parks temporarily, we reopened them, we continue to stay safe. And I think that there is always something new to learn. And I think as we go on, on this journey together, we will continue to adopt best practices and make prudent decisions within the city. Okay, uh, Tiffany, is the city of Hercules doing all it can to protect its residents and others who are present in the city from the effects of COVID-19? And if not, what additional actions should the city take? I think the city has done a good job and I think our residents have done a great job. I, I think we've by and large as a community uh, have dealt with this pandemic uh, in the best ways possible. I applaud the city for immediately in March, you know, uh, placing something on the city website, um, addressing COVID-19, um, addressing the concerns of the community members and saying, you know, we've received concerns from community members and we want to address those. Uh, I think that's, you know, exactly the right first step. Uh, our, we have our local stores, you know, are observing uh, proper measures by implementing store hours for seniors and for people with chronic illnesses or who are at greatest risk. So on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, um, people who are at risk can shop, you know, in a relatively uh, safe environment without, you know, the larger crowds that are in there on, you know, Friday evenings or Saturday mornings. Um, so I, I think the city is doing a great job. I think, we, you know, this pandemic just really caught everyone off guard and, and it's something that we have not experienced uh, in our lifetimes. And so we uh, really had to, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, fly <laughs> uh, blind. And I think uh, Hercules has done an adequate job of, of addressing the concerns of the citizens and, and making sure that we are up to date on what the um, what the uh, you know, the National Centers of Health and California um, Health Advisories have been. Okay, um, Alex, is the city of Hercules doing all it can to protect its residents and others who are present in in the city from the effects of COVID nineteen? And if not, what additional actions should the city take? I think the city has done a good job. I was actually at the seventy six gas station over in Will the other day, and a guy walked in without a mask and like. Um, I don't know the guy's name, but the guy at the cashier, if, if you go there, you'll know who I'm talking about. Um, he immediately kicked the guy out because he's like, you don't have a mask on. And he pointed to the little sign that um, the city of Hercules posted. So I was like, yes, you know, a small little victory um, for Hercules right there and just residents in general. And because COVID has been so fluid, um, I think the city has been really well to adapt to what's been happening. You know, originally back in March when this all kicked off, I don't think anyone would have imagined we would, we would be here right now in August um, with really out uh, with without any, you know, sort of deadline or timeline of when things are going to reopen. And I think the city has done a good job with maintaining, with working with the county um, and the state and, you know, the respectful people on the federal level about what's, um, what's going on right now. And I think that the city will just keep continuing um, working with them and make sure that residents are up to date. Um, because like I said, this situation is fluid. Um, and I think the only way that we can really just keep keep doing what we're doing is to just keep residents informed um, especially like in a few a few weeks ago when July 1st a lot of things were supposed to reopen but we obviously saw that that, that was reversed by the county um, the city was really good at making sure that residents were aware of it so um, people's feelings weren't necessarily hurt but then people were also aware so that way they wouldn't go to the gym and say why is it locked when the county said that it was going to reopen on July 1st and the only way that we can get better is just to work with what we have right now and then just keep rolling with the punches so to speak. Okay thank you. Okay the next question is for um, all four of you. Um, Tiffany you'll have this one first. As we approach fire season what should be done to prepare the residents for possible fires and power outages? 
Oh, that's a great question. I'm always concerned about it because where I live in the flowers and trees, it's, uh, I have dry areas in front of me and behind me. <laughs> so I always feel like I'm sitting in the middle of a tinderbox. Um, I, I think we, uh, residents need to be reminded that um, we are in a high fire area uh, and given information about how to keep our, our homes safe. I appreciate that in the city of Hercules, we have that service where the goats come out and do the clearing um, for the high brush areas. And I, I think that's a, a great asset to our city already. Um, one of the things that the um, uh, Hercules Rodeo uh, Fire Department does annually is a community event where, you know, people come out and learn about fire safety. And they're also open and available to community members just to uh, make an appointment to come in. I took, uh, I was a stay-at-home mom for uh, about a year and a half, and I was taking care of some other kids, and one of the, the activities that we did was go to the fire department. We made an appointment. We went to the fire department. They learned how to use a fire hose. They learned a little bit about fire safety. They learned what the fire fires actually do. Um, so that, you know, that was you know, an activity that I took upon myself, but I think that communication, um, communicating to the community members what you can do independently at your own home to uh, keep yourself safe. I think we take a lot of things for granted just in our, our busy day-to-day -day lives, even under the shelter in place order, you know, we still kind of manage to fill our time with to do's, even those of us who may not be working full time. Um, but safety is, has to be a priority, particularly in fire season. And I think uh, with the, the, our fire um, community is addressing citizens, community members by disseminating information. And then uh, community members are taking it upon themselves to follow action, you know, for, uh, keep, to keep ourselves safe. Then we keep our entire community safe. Okay. Uh, Charlie, as we approach fire season, what should be done to prepare residents for possible fires and power outages? Well, in terms of the power outages, I think it's important that um, we know who and where our senior citizens are, uh, because those people are uh, in a power outage and might have uh, difficulty if they don't have family members about uh, leaving their area, especially if there's uh, uh, a wildfire that starts to impinge directly onto the community. Um, I'd like to make sure that, um, that somehow, somewhere we have uh, a store of um, adequate number of, of face masks because uh, those are always impossible to get during fire season caught off guard like we were with uh, COVID-19 and also last year um, or two years ago with the, um, the, the, the Paradise Fire. It, it just was impossible to even get any kind of face masks. Um, we, we need um, evacuation plans for the schools especially and, and for the community at large. Uh, with, during the New Star Fire, um, there, was, it, there was no there was like traffic jams and people couldn't get out. Um, people uh, were not able to properly uh, get back home from schools. It was pretty much a, um, a potential disaster. Uh, fortunately, the fire was uh, limited and it could have been worse, especially if there was like a wildfire. Um, the, you know, places um, would be perhaps um, locked in. So we have to make sure that we know beforehand and the people are, are notified beforehand of a proper evacuation route. Um, I'd also like to, uh, um, particulate matter um, sen uh, sensors are very inexpensive now and, and our city should actually have ones bordering our uh, grassland areas. So uh, we could immediately know that a fire goes up and setting up a system of uh, monitors would be very inexpensive and, and that could be monitored. And, okay, and so Charlie, that's something I'm looking into. Uh, next, um, Alex, as we approach fire season, what should be done to prepare residents for possible fires and power outages? So um, a little bit of my background in, in the garden, in the garden, what I do in the garden. So um, a couple of years ago when it was the Paradise Fire, my unit was one of the many units that were up there uh, working on the fire. So 
when I was up there, I immediately thought about Hercules. Um, so what I would want to do is get all the parties involved with who's going to be tackling this fire. So the CHP, County Sheriff, Hercules PD, um, Contra Costa County Fire, you know, Crockett, Carquinez Fire District, Rodale Hercules, and then maybe even Contra Costa County Fire to make sure that we understand um, what the possibilities are, what are the hot spots, what are the most places that are at risk, and then also map out the highest, um, the places where the traffic is going to be the highest and evaluate what that evacuation is going to look like to make sure that we have some sort of idea of um, what's going to happen and how many people are going to are going to be affected. So if the fire is at one, if the fire starts at 1 p.m., how many people are going to be able to get out? How many people are going to be trapped? Um, and secondly, project response time to more vulnerable areas. So say it's something like the senior centers hit, um, but then the fire is also starting on Willow. Make sure we understand how many resources we need to have out in the field to make sure that um, we can get these get these tools out there and that they're necessary. And then also work with our schools. You know, if it's something like in, the, say, two years from now when schools are back and people are in school, how are they going to get the kids out and how are they going to make sure that they can get disseminated? You know, the parents may not be able to pick them up, but where are they going to go? Especially if it's like a fire, like where the high school is. Not everyone can go onto the field because they might end up getting trapped in that area. And then also, um, sort of like Charlie said, find out who's the most vulnerable. So like seniors, people with disabilities, people who are on medication, um, like maybe some oxygen that they need to have portable. You know, develop a list of who's the highest priority and who's going to be the most difficult to get out in this situation. Um, and then, like I said, just lastly, let residents know about the evacuations um, routes that the city can take. You know, maybe there's some alternative routes that people can go, but then uh, post a picture of like, okay, these are projected routes. This is what we're, what we're projecting. Because right now I do have my evacuation plan because I know most people are going to hit um, I-80. I I'm going to hit Highway 4 and go around. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Irina, uh, as we approach fire season, what should be done to prepare residents for possible fires and power outages? I think city does a really good job. As um, Alex and Tiffany and Charlie mentioned previously, we do have a lot in place. It's whether it's we bring gods that they can reach the hills that are not easily accessible by residents or by um, city staff. We also do a lot with Rodeo and Hercules Police de uh, Fire Department. Uh, what I'm very proud of that on July 21st, we had our second city hosted its second workshop to present and to get feedback from the residents on our safety element update and local hazard mitigation plan. And what this plan covers is just what are our goals? What are our policies? How do we educate our residents on what are to Alex's point, how, what are the evacuation roads or, and it's not only fires, it's also any other natural disaster that could happen. Not to repeat what other people already suggested, I also think we all should take personal responsibility as homeowners, as renters. How do we make sure that all our property is declared, that there is no uh, debris in buildings, if people need to evacuate, that we are not creating the situation that somebody, especially who could be um, disabled or elderly, doesn't get trapped because of our irresponsibility. Do we have a checklist of preparedness? What do we need? Because if disaster hits, we all know it's natural for people to panic. Do we have all of our immediate belongings that we need to collect and to be able to evacuate in a timely manner. So I think the city and residents, it's our common goal, how we can stay safe and how we engage with each other to ensure that if this disaster hits Hercules, we have a really good plan and we are prepared to face it. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is for the city council members. Um, Alex, you're first. Uh, there has been talk of reimagining policing. Do you agree with that? And if so, what would that look like in Hercules? Oh, yes, I, I totally agree with reimagining policing. I, I think right now we're, we're in a unique situation because all the problems that law enforcement has had in the past are finally coming to the surface with technology. You know, now you can't deny that police brutality is, is, is something that's just made up. Um, it's right there in front of you. you we've seen George Floyd. Um, and plenty of others who have tragically lost their lives at the hand of law enforcement. So what I want to do is um, make sure that we have 
the police officers do an unconscious bias training every other year and not five years because an officer may not be in the department for five years and may not get that training. And along with that, I want to have more community engagement with the police officers. One of the best ways that I kind of got to know the police officers were through the SROs at Hercules with Officer Sanchez and Officer Russell. And I want to make sure that um, we continue to do that. So when Hercules residents interact with the police, it's not just because the lights are behind them and they're getting stopped. And people also have a sense of comfort um, and understanding. And also what I'd like to do is I like to have either a commission for the police department or an advisory committee to the police chief. So that way he has the pulse of um, the community and, and citizens can give him or maybe someone else in the next few years um, advice and understand what's happening in the city and making sure that residents have their, their voices heard. Because I think right now there's a, there's a real big disconnect with law enforcement for all the right reasons. I mean, you know, we do have some really bad cops out there, but then we also have some pretty good cops out there as well. And I think that we just need to bring the community together with that police commission or that advisory committee to make sure that residents' voices are heard and police officers have that training so that way they're aware of what they're doing to the community and how it may make someone feel. Maybe some food. Okay. Um, uh, next is um, Irina. Uh, there's talk of reimagining policing. Do you agree with that? And if so, what would that look like in Hercules? I think Hercules is taking this issue very seriously. And I will stay within um, our local police department and what is important to our residents because there is obviously some police brutality um, that should be addressed, but we don't have this issue in Hercules. So that's why I want to stay in terms of what is important and relevant to us. I've been very proud to see that um, city council and our police department that we had the community policing town hall. And I think it was great that the reason why we did it is to understand the position of our residents. We collected the feedback and then city council held a meeting on uh, within two weeks to um, review the input from the public. And there will be a second uh, city hall town hall meeting to give an opportunity to those who had a lot of questions but didn't have time to ask them because we ran out of time. And as I said before, we typically uh, have a lack of participation from the residents in our town halls and workshops, but I'm very proud to see how important this issue is to everyone. Um, and I understand that police chief in Baden already shared that he has uh, suspended the choroid hold as a permitted tool um, under the department use of force policy here in Hercules. I also, um, understand that we are working with San Pablo and um, Pinol on the statewide um, racial and identity profiling act. And um, I know that we want to implement implicit bias and diversity training for all of the police officers that are part of city of Hercules police department. And so they understand how to serve our diverse community and how it's um, to address everyone in the fair and respectful manner. And I'm, as I said, there are a lot of things that can be done, but Hercules is a safe place. Um, we do have good relationship between community and police officers, and we will continue to move in this direction to keep our city safe. Our criminal violent um, index is lower than statewide. It's definitely much lower than Thank you. We will continue to move in that direction. Uh, Tiffany, there have been talk of reimagining policing. Do you agree with that? And if so, what would that look like in Hercules? I, I like the phrasing reimagining policing because I think that's exactly what we need to do. And I think this conversation that, that we're having um, right now, the conversation that's going on in the city of Hercules and the conversation that's happening on a national level are very important. Um, I'm a mother, I have two sons, and so I have to say, honestly, that, you know, I'm oftentimes frightened and, uh, and I shouldn't be. No one should be frightened. No one should fear police. Our police officers are, um, are hired, are trained to be uh, peace officers, to protect and to serve. And so it is imper imperative that all community members feel that that is the purpose for the police in their in their community 
Uh, I uh, am encouraged that we've had a town hall meeting on policing. I'm encouraged that a second one is scheduled. Um, I would love to have this ongoing conversation. This is a part of the community building that I was speaking of. We need to be able to address directly our, our chief of police, our police officers, and ask real questions and get real responses. Uh, I think one of the things that is uh, was troubling about the last town hall meeting is there were some very direct questions asked um, that uh, from the perception of many community members weren't heard or weren't responded to in a way that made us feel safer than we did going into the conversation in the beginning. Uh, I agree with Alex that there's a very necessary need for um, for uh, bias training, implicit bias training, but also for cultural communication uh, training. There is, I think, a disconnect oftentimes between the way communities of color communicate uh, and, or, and present uh, themselves uh, that is then uh, seen or uh, as uh, threatening or, or named threatening uh, when it's not intended. And so there's a long-term conversation that needs to go on. And yes, I support reimagining. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for all four of you. Um, and Irina is first. Uh, due to COVID, community events such as the 4th of July and the fire station open house have been canceled and will be canceled for the foreseeable future. What ideas do you have to bring the community together or to create community spirit during these, during these difficult times? I think this is a really good question. And I think what we just were discussing that during this COVID-19, we referred to recent town halls that we had city is doing a good job and we need to look into new ways to communicate with each other and stay engaged. Um, in my work, um, what we do is just staying connected because it's very challenging when we don't know each other, when we cannot see each other, when we cannot shake each other's hand and build a relationship that we have. So we need to look into new forms of communicating, which is one of this, what we're doing right now. Normally, um, last year, if we were running for election or for any public of office or we wanted to have a town hall, we would be doing this in person. We would be going door to door. But what now we're doing, we are all staying in Zoom. We still can be connected. I think that's the spirit that counts. And as a city council member, I would continue to promote televising all of our meetings to um, have the communication, collaboration, and transparency going. I will also will offer these Zoom meetings to, as I continue to campaign. And I believe that all of the meetings and community events that we did before, it's going to be different. It's not going to feel the same, but this is our new normal until I don't know when, and it could be part of our new normal forever. We need to learn the ways to communicate virtually, to use social media, and I'm open to all of the ideas and feedback from the community. And I would truly really appreciate if anyone can share some ideas that we have as individuals, professionals, and also public servants. Okay. Uh, Tiffany, um, due to COVID, community events such as the 4th of July and the fire station open house have been canceled and will be canceled for the foreseeable future. What ideas do you have to bring the community together or to create community spirit during these difficult times? Well, I'm going to echo Irina a little bit uh, in the use of technology. I mean, we've all had to grow more accustomed to reaching out via technology. Um, but I think we need to expand upon that. We need to bring in um, activities and events that embrace everyone. So our, you know, our teens and our, and our children are the techs tech experts of our country. <laughs> um, I have a 19 year old and a 12 year old and you know, and I lean on them constantly for uh, assistance with uh, technology. Um, and there, I think our teens are one of the most underserved groups in our community be, because we have very little for teens to, to do around here. And so this is a great opportunity, I think, for teens to take the lead um, and uh, create 
uh, community um, activities via Zoom or whatever um, technology form they choose to use, I'm usually behind by about two years. So, <laughs> um, but also we have the opportunity for some safe social distancing activities. Uh, when I started this uh, journey on the election process mm -hmm. and I was in need of nomination signatures, I had an outdoor event, social distancing. Uh, someone brought out cones that I could spread about so, so people could keep a safe distance. Um, I asked everyone to wear a mask. We provided pens so people could take away a pen. You don't have to reuse a pen. We provided hand sanitizer. They're, they're easy, low cost things that we can do to bring the community together and keep everyone safe. And I think we should ex explore those um, so that we can continue to drive a community spirit that we, um, you know, I think we do need opportunities to get outside of our homes. Uh, community walks, uh, we had a community walk um, uh, about a month ago and it was beautiful. We started at Refugio Valley Park and did a walk uh, across the street to where the big lots in, in Home Depot are and then down across San Pablo Avenue and back up and around again. And it was beautiful. Um, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlie, due to COVID, community events such as the 4th of July and the fire station open house have been canceled and will be canceled for the foresee foreseeable future. What ideas do you have to bring the community together or to create community spirit during these difficult times? Well, I, I full responses and uh, when uh, Tiffany brought up the concept of community walks, I think that was a great idea because I've, I've met um, from social distancing that a lot of new neighbors now because of COVID so many people are using our newly built uh, Bay Trail. So I think that people need to go out there now that there's uh, less pollution out there that people should actually get out and enjoy nature I, uh, that people can do. And, and I noticed it's brought families together for the first time uh, in, in a community kind of way that you know, people who are usually just leading their own private lives are now out there walking with other people. Um, there's a couple things in terms of teenagers that, that we could be able to uh, incorporate into the school. Um, one would be um, to have, um, uh, because of the, the stark need right now to actually have a uh, response uh, online course that could be offered through the high school. So uh, everybody really needs to do uh, first aid and emergency response. And I know doing it online is not a complete thing, but I think that it could cover a lot of different aspects of emergency response and, and community response to emergencies and give uh, young people an important tool that they might have to use on family or friends or children first aid response. And, and most people don't get that, but it's really an important thing. And everybody who's ever gotten it usually does it multiple times and realizes the value of that. And also um, in terms of uh, um, um, uh, responding to uh, a wildfire uh, in terms of particulate matter monitors, there's a, a lot of um, that young people can do uh, and citizens in general to um, support a, a network like that. So I'd like to work with the fire department in setting up a, a particulate matter detector system that could um, respond uh, Im immediately to a fire even in the middle of the night to know that there is uh, an uh, unusual amount of smoke being present. So that is something uh, that- Thank you, Brian. In. Thank you. Alex, uh, due to COVID, community events such as the 4th of July and the fire station open house have been canceled and will be canceled for the foreseeable future. What ideas do you have to bring the community together or to create community spirit during these difficult times? Sure. So I think that we can utilize the power of Zoom. Um, I've seen a lot, a lot of different museums have had like virtual museum nights. So maybe we can log on to Zoom and then get that fired up, have a movie night, um, you know, for different ages, different groups, have consistent town halls so people are up to date with what's happening. Um, and then even have like a meet your neighbor night. So, you know, people log into Zoom and they go into different breakout rooms and they have an opportunity to meet someone in the birds that when they live in Victoria that they ordinarily would have never had any sort of interaction with. And I think if we do that along with um, 
working with the season. So you do – right now we're obviously in summer, but we know that's not going to last forever. And so when a rainy season comes around, really plan for these events um, that people can do indoors. So maybe find someone who wants to do a Zumba class and then someone utilizes that um, when it's a little rainy outside and people can't normally, you know, use the Bay Trail. And then along with that, see if we can find people who have classes, maybe like a cooking class or some sort of activity like knitting, just something where we can maintain interaction, obviously from a safe distance, but then still work with the conditions in which, you know, the world is giving us right now. Um, so I think that that can be done through movies, classes, um, town halls, and then just like meet and greets. Me and my friends, we did that actually. We've had a movie nights and we had like a little concert where we had some different people that we knew come and perform. And it was the first time that I like really seen my friends' faces in like weeks. And so it was really nice to do that. Okay. All right, our, our next question is for the um, city council members. Uh, Tiffany, you're first. As development progresses, what new businesses would you like to see in Hercules? Uh, oh, that's, I like that question. <laughs> uh, I, I've talked with a lot of community members and certainly with my family. Um, we'd be excited to see some more um, uh, dining options uh, here in Hercules, a, a nice uh, sit down restaurants and particularly uh, right around that Sycamore Crossing because that's in closest proximity to where I am. Although, you know, we love driving down by the water and going to Layla's by the Bay or um, to um, Powder Cake. You know, it would be nice to have something on this side. Uh, you know, uh, Alex talked about earlier, he spoke to not being able to buy clothing in this area. It'd be really nice to have, you know, uh, clothing retail options in this, in the Hercules community. Um, and so I think there are lots of possibilities uh, for our continued growth. Um, we're bringing in big name stores um, as our as our anchors. Um, and so, you know, it will be interesting to see what builds around it. But certainly there is a, a community calling for um, for other eateries. <laughs> I think we're all in the house and all, we're thinking about food a lot more. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Okay. Um, Alex, as development progressives, what new businesses would you like to see at Hercules? So I would love to see new restaurants. That would be great. Maybe some retail, like maybe an Old Navy. That seems to be like the beacon of all clothing. Um, but also something a little bit more abstract, you know, maybe in the near future, like a roller rink or an ice rink, something that will force people to travel a good distance to come out here. Um, I'm a big fan of roller skating personally, and I know that there's always a bunch of different restaurants that surround the areas. So something like that. Um, and then different types of restaurants, sort of like how like the veranda works. I would love to see some development like that where you can go from shop to restaurant and then have like activities outside, such as like the cornhole and ping pong. So that way, you know, kids are occupied and then also it gives you a reason to uh, hang out and stay. Okay. Um, Irina, as developments progress, what new businesses would you like to see in Hercules? As I said earlier, I think it's very important for us to have a very good balance between residential, commercial, retail, and just public um, user spaces. Um, I think we all agree that we would like to see more restaurants, we would like to see more retail because that generates not only it's something that residents need and will enjoy, but it also generates sales um, revenue for us. Um, we are Sycamore project is one where we have potentially it was approved by the city where we approved the first hotel for the city. It also generates additional revenue for the city and attracts a lot of smaller businesses such as retail and small restaurants because um, you need to have some population that and you need to have some movement to attract businesses. It's been our problem because we are surrounded by some cities that historically had more retail than us and um, it's challenging. Having said that, we also need to take into consideration what is happening right now with e-commerce and be very careful as we selecting. So I would stay focused on not big um, retail stores and brick and mortars, but more smaller businesses, smaller restaurants and cafes and then um, small coffee shops, but also something where our youth as well as our senior citizens who spend more time at home um, and within the community have some place to go and entertain themselves. It could be, as Alex mentioned, maybe some um, gyms and with some room for 
community involvement where you can play ping pong or some other activities. So this is certainly what we need to have this, um, our vision for the citizens of and um, residents of Hercules to have this pedestrian community where you can have a self-sustained social activity within the city. And we have a beautiful town and we just need to attract more businesses. And I think we have a good plan to do that. Okay. All right, uh, the next question is also for the city council members. Alex, you're first. Uh, do you know why the Sycamore Crossings project is not moving forward? From my understanding, it's because of COVID. So like a lot of projects where we're getting ready to start, but then COVID kind of stopped things um, and, and just kind of put it at a halt. And from my understanding, it, um, it still has some issues with the property developer, with the, with the owners of the property. Um, and I'm not too sure 100% on when it's gonna get back going. Okay. Uh, Irina, do you know why the Sycamore Crossings project is not moving forward? Well, the Sycamore project, it was approved and um, the goal was to start um, construction, I believe, and I'm going by my memory, um, later in the process to begin with. There are some challenges that um, in terms of the um, utilities and that needs to be resolved first. So um, we actually do have all of the um, candidates for um, the city council office meeting with on, uh, which is scheduled by city clerk and city manager on August 13th. And this is one of the updates that I would like to hear on these projects as to what of the challenges. We do know that we had to stop Safeway construction for a period of time, but now this project is up and running. We do know that we completed the exchange um, let course be, uh, building that um, they also working on their second parcel. Um, but there are challenges in terms of attracting retail. So the while it's easier and right now it's taking, everything is taking longer. I do know this based on the business that I do in my professional capacity. So, but to answer more broadly, um, I will have more information after our meeting with city staff on August 13th, and we can get back to our residents asking these questions. Okay, uh, Tiffany, do you know why the Sycamore Crossing project is not moving forward? Uh, I don't have anything to add to what Alex and Arena have uh, communicated. Uh, I, I, like everyone else, am looking forward to, you know, having them move forward. Uh, the Safeway project, you know, was moving forward quite well. And COVID-19 has impacted so many th things in our lives. And we know that we want to keep everyone safe. So we want workers who are coming out to work on those projects to be safe. And so um, I, I think the delay on this project is, is you know, somewhat a result of that. And um, and I'm sure that our, I'm confident that our, our city leaders will give us more information as the project moves forward. Okay. Um, the next question is for all four candidates. Uh, Charlie, you're first. Uh, Black Lives Matter and systemic racism has been prominent in the news lately. Do you feel these, these are issues within the, the fire district? And if so, how would you address it as a board member? Um, I think that um, Black Lives Matter and systemic racism probably is not like a, a major issue with the fire department, although um, because of the relationship of systemic racism and, and um, poverty, uh, I think it's, it's really important to make sure that uh, people in our lower income communities that, that are served uh, to the maximum extent possible and are not overlooked in terms of their uh, the healthcare situation. So I think that that is where systemic racism the most. I don't think it is a problem with the uh, fire uh, department. Uh, the fire department is, is mixed race and uh, that is not really an issue because they, they don't, uh, they're not involved in police powers with uh, the average citizen. So um, I think that we have a really good uh, fire department in terms of racism. Um, I haven't heard problems about problems within the fire department. That the relationship between systemic racism and, and poverty 
is, is real, real important. And the, the lack of medical care to our, our poor um, citizens, our, our poorest citizens, and uh, the need for the fire department to be first responders to these people is their one link to uh, um, emergency and hospital care. So I think that's where the uh, systemic racism issue is most important to address. Thank you. Okay. Um, Irina, uh, Black Lives Matter and systemic racism has been prominent in the news lately. Do you feel that these are issues within, within Hercules? And if so, how would you address them as a council member? As I shared with all of you, um, I am an immigrant and um, as a female immigrant, I am very aware of um, how difficult and challenging it is um, to be successful. What, but I also believe in American dream. And um, fortunately for myself and my family, as we immigrated to the United States, we were able to realize that. It wasn't easy, but we were able to achieve. So it is my aspiration to assure that every American, every resident of Hercules, regardless of their upbringing, place of birth, um, race, has the same opportunities. We live in a very uh, diverse community. Our demographics are, we have um, Asian that represent about 47%. African Americans represent 15% of our community. Whites represent 27% and the remaining is between two or more races or other. And we need to ensure that all voices are heard. Everyone feels very safe and everyone is treated fairly. And this is where a lot of topics that we discussed today in terms of our youth development, in terms of police, in terms of what we can do as a community to come together because we all have the same goals. We want to the prosperity of the city. We want to feel safe within our city and we want everyone to be treated fair and equally. And that's what, as a city council member, I will work on and will be very focused on um, getting engaged with the community, hearing your feedback and um, working with all of you on making sure that we do live in our diverse community that continues to prosper and thrive for every single one of us. Thank you. Tiffany, Black Lives Matter and systemic racism has been prominent in the news lately. Do you feel that these are issues within Hercules? And if so, how would you address them as a council member? Um, yes, I, I do think that uh, these issues are, are, an issue in Hercules. Hercules is a microcosm of the United States of America. And I think this conversation that we're finding, this very uncomfortable conversation that we're having in our country right now is finally addressing that we live in a country that was founded on the concept of racism, that you know, our, our, our wonderful founding fathers who did great things to build a nation, did it on the backs of Native American people and African American people, um, brought in you know, people of Chinese descent to build our railroads. We, we have a country that has a history of racism and because it has a history of racism, those, that racism is built into our systems, the systemic racism. Um, and so breaking down something that has, em, is deeply embedded into the fabric of our nation is uh, challenging and it does in fact our law enforcement it does in fact um, every ask in our fire departments it impacts everything and it goes so unnoticed so often because we're so accustomed to it and unless you are a person of color who is the person being stopped by four police officers you're the the black kid walking down the street that gets pulled over because you're carrying a bat and it's perceived as a weapon instead of something to go play baseball with at the park. Uh, it's, it, it is very, uh, you know, we as Americans uh, live, live the American life, but we live distinctly different American lives. And I think it's a really uncomfortable thing to talk about that. Um, I, I mean, to talk to about a little bit about her journey as an immigrant, 
you know, and that's a different experience. That's a different kind of American experience. And we all see the American opportunity. We all see the opportunity for growth. We all believe in the idealism of America, but it hasn't been achieved for every American. Thank you. Alex, Black Lives Matter and systemic racism have been prominent in the news lately. Do you feel these are issues within Hercules? And if so, how would you address it as a council member? Black lives certainly do matter. Um, I do believe that is a problem in Hercules. I can't tell you how many times me and my friends have been stopped by the police simply because we were skateboarding. One time I was in high school and I was actually maybe about 800 feet away from my house. Like it's like the very beginning of my neighborhood. This police officer stopped me and asked me, did I live in the neighborhood? I was like, oh man, this, I was maybe like 14. And I, so I didn't, have an, I didn't have an ID or a driver's license yet. And he told me, well, you don't look like you live here. And I know you, he's like, yeah, I know you don't live here. I've never seen you. I've lived here since I was six years old, so I know this community. Um, and and when, when it comes to systematic racism in law enforcement, it's completely built in the fabric of our nation. One in four black men will go to jail at some point in their life. Black people don't even make up 16% of the nation's population, yet 40% of the people who are incarcerated right now are black. So yes, yeah, systematic racism is a very real thing, and it is here in Hercules as well. Now, this is not to bash the Hercules Police Department and say that every single person, every officer in the department is bad, but I'm saying that there are some people that we definitely do need to work on. Um, and this is where the unconscious bias training comes in because maybe you're racially profiling someone and you don't even notice it. You know, maybe you were given a description that says five foot eight, black male, fair skin, and suddenly that falls into every black person that you see. So that's how I would want to address it is through the unconscious bias trainings and then working with the community. Um, so that way voices are heard through that advisory committee, through that, that police commission. So the pulse is, is, is felt here in Hercules. Um, on the residents of Hercules, I posted, I posted a poll. How do people feel about the um, Hercules Police Department? And so the responses were tip, kind of actually what I expected. The majority of the people that said yes, that they felt the police were doing okay, were white. And the people who felt that the police had a problem were people of color. So it does, this, this is a real thing here in Hercules. And yes, Hercules is a nice city. It's, it's rather quiet, but that doesn't mean that we're escaping some of the problems that Hercules has felt. You know, me and my friends have felt it when we were stopped by the police when we were 15 and the police were screaming at me and my friend Keyshawn, we're both black, but the person who was screaming at the police officer was Asian. So yes, Hercules does have its problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, the next question is for the city council members. Uh, Irina, you're first. Currently, there is no safe way to walk from Foxborough to Central Hercules. What would you do to correct that? As we discussed previously, we obviously need to focus on our safety elements and it comes in all different ways. It's not only natural disaster, it's also how we move around the city in a very safe manner. I do know that city has a plan, which is a general plan. I don't have an answer right now how I would address this, but this is specifically within this vicinity. But what I will work on is to address that Generally, in Hercules, all of the pedestrians and all of the bikers that take, like we're building right now a lot of roads and we will have more population that is growing and we're building the Safeway, we're building the Sycamore um, projects, we're building our exchange at Bayfront. How do we have the circulation element that works for everyone regardless of what our means for movement, whether it's public transportation, if you have a car, if you walking down the street, or if you would like to ride your bike. So this is as a city council, we would have to take into consideration and make sure that everyone needs are properly addressed. Okay, uh, Tiffany, currently there is no safe way to walk from Foxborough to Central Hercules. What would you do to correct that? Um, well, that's a really great question, and that's something that I wasn't really aware of. So I, uh, I think it's definitely something we as a city need to address. We need to take a look at that and how we can keep our, our pedestrians safe, um, have a safe route to Central Hercules. So that's uh, in terms of our city planning moving forward. I think that's uh, something that's actually that should be on the table. Uh, I don't have a plan off the top of my head, but it's certainly something that I would be um, more than happy to address with the city council. Alex, currently there is no safe way to walk uh, from Foxborough to Central Hercules. What would you do to correct that? 
So I would analyze all the uh, walkways that we have right now. So one of the ways you can go up Willow, pass by Valley Bible, and then go to that little yard spot um, right where the transit center begins. If you're like facing towards Highway 4, uh, make sure that that is completely paved out and that there's enough lighting for people to walk and that we knock down the foliage to make sure that people feel safe and protected when they are walking there, say if it's in the evening or dusk, whenever. Um, and then with the new development, say like Hilltown, make sure that we can create a path that takes you directly over to the hill into the rest of Hercules. Um, so that way citizens have a more convenient way. Because I understand that, you know, Foxborough, you do basically have to walk like halfway around the city before you can get anywhere. And so I wanna make sure that we have adequate lighting and we have sidewalks basically stretching the entire length of, of what someone would have to walk so that they can get from point A to B. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to the uh, end of our time and we want to allow time for some closing remarks. So this will be our last question and it's going to be for all of you. Uh, Tiffany, you're first. Uh, what should be done to support youth, young adults, and seniors? Um, yeah, these are, these are the members of the community that I think um, are often overlooked and underrepresented. Uh, I think, and they all have unique needs. Um, we have very little in the way of opportunity for teens in the community. I really think as we're planning forward, I think Alex had some great ideas about activity-based um, businesses that we could uh, introduce to our city. And we can, taking into the consideration the, the needs of the various age groups. Um, even with our younger children, um, we have activities over at the community center, but they're generally uh, for a few hours at cost. And for some families, the costs seem a bit exorbitant in the fact that we, there's no transportation opportunity uh, to and from home and from working adults. They, those can be problematic even in the summertime. Um, after school centers in our area, again, you know, they're at cost. And, so we uh, have a distinct disconnect between different communities and their economic ability um, to pay for such you know, uh, necessities. Um, and then with our seniors, again, we have some designated senior community, senior housing, but there are a lot of seniors that are living in their own homes um, you know, and prefer to stay there in, for the foreseeable future. And, and so we need to make sure that things are accessible for them and safe for them. So in thinking in regard to uh, the new forms of transportation, uh, access to the um, uh, regional uh, intermodal transportation center, for example, uh, that they're e as accessible to seniors as they are for, you know, uh, you know young adults or, or middle-aged folks. Um, and my time is up again. <laughs> okay. Alex, what should be done to support youth, young adults, and seniors? So to support youth, young adults, and seniors, this is where we collaborate with John Sweat Unified, West County um, School Board, and the County Board of Education to make sure that kids' educational um, needs are met through an equitable lens, too, especially those who may be in a situation where they may not have um, Wi-Fi at home to log into Zoom or even a laptop. And then also work with outside organizations. Um, the beauty of like being where we are is that we're close to everything. So we need to work with outside organizations to make sure that kids can get either technology, internships, externships, or even work with unions so that way their futures are a little, are a little bit more bright and they have a chance to succeed um, in the later world. In addition to that, I want to develop a youth commission so that way, or bring back the youth commission, I should say, um, so that way the voices of the young folks are heard and then have development so we can be understanding of those who may not want to pay a fee or have the financial need, uh, financial um, funds to, to, make, to make certain payments to do certain things. So like if we're going to have a new park in the future, make sure that kids with autism or Down syndrome or even physical limit, uh, limitations are access can, um, can properly utilize it. So I saw a really cool swing in San Francisco that was for kids in wheelchairs. And I thought that that was absolutely awesome. And I would wanna see something like that here in Hercules. And then when it, in terms of seniors, um, I wanna make sure that we work with organizations, the county, state, whoever else, 
is involved to make sure that seniors' needs are met. Maybe there's some in-home therapies that we can um, get going for seniors um, on the city website, make sure we have stuff that's available in terms of consumer fraud in case someone becomes a victim of a scam. And then also resources for seniors that they may need. You know, maybe somebody's living alone and they don't have someone to pick up their prescriptions or just someone that they can call for companionship or maybe some advice nurse and then um, just have development that's friendly for seniors. Like instead of having stairs always in front of buildings, which is, can be the case in some places, make sure that the ramp is first. And then really um, understanding what sort of limitations are people facing, you know, in terms of development and even things to do in the city to make sure we can uh, address that. Okay. Uh, Charlie, what should be done to support youth, young adults and seniors? Well, um, I think everybody's given uh, really examples of what can be done from the city council point of view, uh, from the uh, fire district's point of view. Um, for seniors, for example, uh, it, it, say if there's a power outage, uh, then their air conditioner doesn't work. And so we need to have a place that is um, both a, uh, an some kind of evacuation center or a breathing center where people can go and, and be in an air conditioned, uh, safe environment, say if there's a, a wildfire, um, you know, uh, those people are most vulnerable. So we need to have something uh, potentially in place, even if it's an ad hoc situation to be able to uh, plan uh, for that eventuality. Uh, in terms of youth, uh, um, if what the fire district could do is, is uh, we could, um, institute uh, first aid training and uh, cert training uh, um, to response training for community members and, and those things could be uh, initiated or, or begun even under the current COVID-19 situation and they should be encouraged for young people and all citizens to participate in but perhaps by partnering with the, the schools that there could be something that could be done in a more formal sense and uh, promote it to a, a wider group of students. Uh, and in terms of general, um, better uh, uh, outdoor amenities for, for people to be able to participate in a walk and, and, and uh, breathe the air is, is really important. So we really need to open that up, the, the walking spaces and parklands in, in our community so people can uh, take advantage of that and uh, increase our overall quality of life. Thank you. Irina, what should be done to support youth, young adults, and seniors? What we need to do is continue to focus on our uh, parks and recreations and um, also, again, library. I know that there is a lot of questions about it and discussions, not only at the Hercules level, but generally. And I do understand that parks and recreations um, are taking up about 15% of our overall um, expenditures. But I also know that parks and recreation services are one of the most important factors in surveys of how livable the communities are. Um, they provide places and accessibility for persons of all ages and abilities, which is extremely important. I think the Hercules Library is one of the jewels that represents the place for whether you are youth or um, you may be a senior citizens where you can go and spend more time. I was very happy to see that we uh, went above and beyond 35 hours allowed by the county um, that we went up to 43 hours in our 2021 budget for the city of Hercules. Because again, it's not only the place where youth and um, anyone actually, any age and ability could spend good quality time and be more educated. It also helps us in crime prevention. And these are the programs that are extremely important and I'm very supportive of. Um, additionally, planning. Um, as I was the part and I am a part of the planning commission, uh, every single project that was approved in uh, the last three years, we were very focused on ensuring that anyone, again, of any age or ability is able to enjoy great living conditions within these new developments. Um, we always focus on um, 
ensuring that there are some ground floor units with no stairs, if possible. Of course, we cannot dictate and there is a building code and other things that we have to take into consideration. But I do know that it has been the focus of Planning Commission and the City Council on ensuring that what we build and how we continue to grow is done in a very responsible manner, taking into consideration our senior citizens and also youth in terms of parks and how and where we can spend time that we don't have to travel. Prime. Prime. Okay. Um, okay, so that was our last question. I wanna thank you all for the time you've spent with us and your thoughtful answers. At this time, I'm gonna give each candidate two minutes for a summation, and you can provide your campaign, email, website, information, whatever you would like to provide. Uh, we're gonna do it in reverse order from the introductions. So it'll be Charlie, Tiffany, Irina, and then Alex. So Charlie, do you wanna start? Sure, thank you. Um, I don't have a website yet, um, and I, I definitely plan on doing that. Um, because that will be good, uh, hopefully, advertisement for the fire district as well as my candidacy. Um, I, I believe that my background in, in public health and uh, knowledge about healthcare issues and um, really important to bring to this uh, for the fire district. I, I think it's the, the, one of the most important services that we have. Um, and it needs to be expanded and, and, and try to uh, cover up some of the gap that we have in uh, not having doctor's hospital here. Uh, hopefully that can be resolved in, in the future in some kind of way. I, I think it's really, really critical um, that uh, we're in good standing right now uh, uh, for the moment with our fire department in terms of finances, but that needs to be guaranteed uh, and probably um, as the, the fire district just would be striving for excellency over time, we'll probably have to come up with more funds to support uh, more services for the fire district. So I do hope to work real closely with hopefully all three of you on the city council. I think to say, I think it's uh, would be really, really uh, uh great opportunity to get critical feedback and support from the city council with your all's presence and um, knowledge of this, the city itself. Uh, I hope to bring some awareness of the situation uh, and the needs of Rodeo citizens as well. So I realized that Hercules um, has a, an advantage. It spread some of that advantage out in the fire district towards the residents of Hercules who in many, many ways are under met already. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and, and for the wonderful questions put forward and to the ability to share in this dialogue with you all. And uh, hopefully we can continue this dialogue in the future. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany? Just want to say thank you for this opportunity today. It was a wonderful opportunity to address the questions that were asked. Uh, for anyone who's interested in learning more about me, my web address is www.tiffanygrimsley.co. Tiffanygrimsley.co. My email address is tiffany number four hercules at gmail.com. Tiffany for hercules at gmail.com. Um, I am an invested community member. I have my mom, I'm a wife, uh, I love the city of Hercules, I'm very passionate about being a part of the future of Hercules. I want to ensure that we maintain our quality of living for existing residents and for our new residents coming in as our community continues to develop and grow. Um, I want to ensure that we manage issues around transportation and accessibility. And as the world around us is dealing with issues of equity and justice, I want to make sure that all Herculeans feel safe, that we live in a city um, that is going to offer safety and security for everyone. Um, this is a city that I call home, and I want to make sure my home is safe. Thank you. Irina? I want to take this time to thank everyone who participated in today's uh, conversation and discussion. 
I think the more I learn about the concerns and the more I communicate with the residents and the panelists today, this reinforcement, this reinforces my commitment and willingness to work very hard for Hercules to ensure that it remains a diverse community and it continues to grow and thrive. There are some challenges, but there are also a lot of opportunities. And I want us to focus on opportunities while addressing challenges. There is always the way to move forward. And as a proven leader and, and, and effective leader, someone who serve on the planning commission for almost four years right now, understands inner workings of the city, has a good established relationship and understanding how the city works, um, has the communication with the residents that is being ongoing and having open dialogue with all of you today. I do hope that you will uh, vote for me and will allow me an opportunity to continue to serve now in a new capacity. If you would like to learn more about me, please feel free to reach me at Irina for Hercules at gmail.com. Actually, I will probably, it's easier to put um, all this information in the chat. But again, thank you for the opportunity and I humbly ask you for your vote and for your support. And if elected, I promise that I will work very hard on ensuring that we succeed together. Thank you. Alex? So thank you everyone for uh, participating today. I had a really good time and I had a lot of fun. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a soldier and soldiers, we never, we never work alone. We always work in teams and this is a team effort. You know, if elected to the city council, yes, I will be one of the decision makers, but that decision won't be made individually. It will be through the collective voices and actions of residents from around the city, giving me perspective and insight into various issues. Being that I'm a soldier, I'm used to hearing people that I would normally disagree with on the political scale. So that means I'm used to working with people of all backgrounds and I encourage it. You can reach out to me. I'm actually, all my information is right there. 510-367-2958. Um, um, Alex, the number four, Hercules at gmail.com. If you want to text me, email me, doesn't matter. Call me even. Um, and I want to give back to my city. But I know, like I said, that this is a team effort and all perspectives are always going to be welcome with me. And I'm at your service at any given time. My experience working with seniors, children with disabilities, um, working for Congressman Desaigne, working for the Richmond City Council, and working with different levels of government from the federal all the way down to local has given me a unique perspective and an eye for attention to detail and working to find new challenges. I mean, working to find um, resolutions to challenges that may not necessarily be there. So my door is always open to those who want to have a conversation and give their feedback on what they believe needs to happen for Hercules, because a city council member is a voice of the constituents um, and all walks of life, from the animals to the wildlife to the people. And I think that we can do this together. So I hope to have your vote. And even if not, still work together on some really cool things to improve Hercules. Thank you. All right. Um, this ends our forum. Thanks to the candidates and the public for participating in this forum. A special thanks to the Hercules Democratic Party for sponsoring this forum and the committee who put this together. Thank you all and remember to vote. <laughs>